he had a Stanley knife in his in his hand. He slit slit one wrist and slit the other one and went, "You're next." And he brought out this massive block of crack. The most efficient thing I could do is to actually make myself out to be a problematic consumer. But I once made a really bad mistake. I'd made myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamines. And spoiler, I'm not. When he found that camera, there was no doubt what was winking up at him. I instantly knew there was a, a serious risk of them killing me. You, know, you run away from wolves, they'll chase you. Well, if the universe is going to get me, you can come and get me. I don't know why they didn't just shoot you. Preservation of life is always the number one priority of of a police officer. That never changed. At that point in time, there was a huge amount of pressure on police to increase the arrests around drugs. And one thing no one ever told me about was PTSD. 20% of British cops have got some form of PTSD. Half of the rest have got potential precursor behaviours. You need to be looking after your cops if you want your police service to improve. The longer that people like me are on the streets, the more the violence increases. This week on a debrief, then, I've got an undercover narcotics officer, right? Former. I've got to add, right? He's not still doing it or he wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> His name's Neil. How are you, Neil? You all right? I'm all right, Phil. How are you? Thanks for coming on, buddy. Listen, the way we're going to do this today is I'm going to, I'm going to take you back to your childhood first. I want, to, I want to know all about you, all right? So I'm going to give you a bit of a, a debrief, interrogation type style, all right? So we're going to go back. Growing up, how was you? Where did where, where'd you, where'd you hail from? What did you, you do? How was your parents? All that sort of stuff. Oh, quite, quite a um a relaxed upbringing really uh, i grew up in a very sort of uh, middle class type of town stable background very stable background uh, yeah. the town was buxton in the peak district which is quite a posh town really yeah. um so i was quite sheltered to okay be so, quite. so a nice gentle type good parents yeah lots of countryside together, sort of stuff yeah yeah walking the dog in the fields you know as a child and you know just yeah quite yeah. ideal really to be honest but cool. what about school what were you like at school Lazy, okay. Uh, lazy at school. Um, you know, my, my reports were always is is smart but could work harder. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was my standard report, really. Um, so, I, I suppose I couldn't wait to get out and have an adventure. From, yeah. From... Did you do any outside of school activities? Were you a cadet or anything like that? Were you, you know, did you play football? Were you, you know, did, did you do anything outside of school? No, I was more of a music geek. Okay. Um, so I I, I would. Spend all of my time hunting out music. Okay, did Listen. you play anything? Did you any any instruments or anything like that? Did, did I used you... to sing. So my oh, first okay. first bang I, a band I sang in, sang in was when I was seventeen, a heavy metal band. Wow, was that singing or screaming? Looking back at it, I could sing. Yeah. I, but I can wail as well. I can growl <laughs> if I have to, if I have to <laughs> I with a bit growl. of warming with a bit of warming up. <laughs> what was the band called? Neu Regal. Right. Okay. So... Apparently it was German, but no one ever explained it to me. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> How did it do? We did all right. We did, yeah. you know, pubs and local parties and that kind of thing. That that's that's been the limit of my um music success throughout my life really doing it's fun. It's good fun, isn't it? I oh, imagine. I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Plenty, of, plenty of booze and all that sort of stuff. Hanging around with musicians, talking music and singing. Rock and roll, that's all right. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so when did you start thinking about the police force? I didn't, really. I wasn't one of those kids who would run around with a plastic policeman's helmet on his head it no. was not something that even came into my brain but what happened to me is i went to university by mistake by mistake by mistake because okay. i remember sitting listening to this lecture thinking why on earth have i gone to university to study business studies it's incredibly boring and i've got no interest in it so i dropped out of university which okay. you know causes a little bit of a family crisis when your parents aren't impressed with it you're dropping out. Yeah, because they just they just want you to do they they want to see you happy and doing your thing, don't they? But yeah, if yeah. you're not happy, you can't do it, can you? I, that that would be advice I'd give to anybody at a young age. If you're not happy, pop smoke and get out of there, isn't it? Yeah, the earlier the better, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So I didn't know what to do. I, I was thinking about going backpacking around Europe because a couple of my friends had gone <laughs> off and done an adventure like that. So I, I was thinking about doing that, and then I saw an advertisement for the police locally, and I thought, well, that'd be different, right? Yeah. So I couldn't make my mind up about backpacking or applying for the police. So I flipped a coin and it came up heads. And so I applied for the police. Wow. So literally flippant about it. You are, you flipped a coin to go and join the old Bill. So you, you, how was training? But where was training? What, what did you what, what, what did you do? Where, where did you go? My uh, initial training was in Coventry at, at 
uh, writing. Okay. And that was horrible. Uh, I found it really difficult. Lots of screaming and shouting and that sort of stuff, really. But yeah, it was still in the age where it was based on a sort of military um, discipline type so of. Bit of so you did do marching about. We all marched that sort between of marched yeah. between the classrooms, yeah, yeah which was quite <laughs> peculiar. Um, and I found it difficult. I found the whole of the police training and, and and my first two years really difficult because I only found out how sheltered and young I was when when I got into the police. Yeah, and I was. I'd grown up in a sheltered place. With, with limited... Um, do, you think, do you think you were naive to some of the stuff that was going on? I was incredibly naive. Really? Okay. Yeah, to- totally unprepared uh, for what I'd taken on, completely. Okay. So how long, how long was training? Well, you do, I think, is it 14, 10 or 14 weeks initially, and then okay. you do, every few weeks you do another two weeks. So you're training off and on for the first two years, and you're in a probationary period for, okay. that, for those uh, first yeah, two probation. years. So, so you can be sacked at any time in those first two years. And I was clinging on for by my fingernails <laughs> the whole time. So what was your first? What was your first beat? Where did you go? What was your first police station? What, what was that about? I was in um, the south of Derby on the Ring Road, an area called um, Alveston and okay. Allenton, um, which was apparently the highest crime rate in the county at the time. Um, Do you remember your first collar? First one, yeah, it was um, a disqualified driver with my with my tutor. Um, Funnily enough, I arrested the same guy on my own my, within, my, within my first two weeks on my own um, a few weeks later when I'd been called to a domestic dispute and I was on foot and I was the only person on, there. Um, and this guy who had just been banned from driving because we'd caught him and he was uh, fighting with his wife. I went into the living room. His wife's in the kitchen. In the living room, there was a TV and one sofa in the middle of the room. Right. Nothing, nothing else in the room. And he said, "It's you." And he got a, he had a Stanley knife in his in his hand. He slit slit one wrist Ooh. and slit the other one, and went, "You're next." And so I started running around the sofa, and he's following me around the sofa. And it was a bit like <laughs> it was almost like there's some music going on in your head. It did feel really farcical. And I'd but bear in mind, I'd actually run three times around the sofa before I realised I had a staff in my pocket. Yeah. And worse than that, I'd run th- three rounds, three times around the sofa before I remembered I'd got a radio to call for backup. <laughs> I was just like running, <laughs> just, I'm get away chasing after me with his knife. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he'll bleed out before he catches me. I, I, that thought actually did occur to me. No, he's got to slow down. He's got to slow down before me, right? He's got to. Yeah, yeah so that was that was an interesting... Did, 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 he, did he get you out of that end? Did, he, did, you, did you lift him? What? He ran out of steam, sat down on the arm of the sofa, um, and by that time... There was actually a car really close, so backup arrived within seconds. Patched him up, and I, f- I felt pretty useless to be honest, because I'm stood there like, "Oh, he's given up," and then my two colleagues came in and and lifted him. So. <laughs> you done all the hard work, and they, they they got the glory for him downtown. Yeah. So that first is it a couple of years you do on the beat? Is it? Well, it de- it depends. I mean, I, I spent time patrolling in a car as well on the as on the beat. During my, that first two years, any incidents spring to mind whilst you were sort of like doing the normal copper type work? Oh God, um, no, there's, there's so many things really. Um, it was all the, the normal kind of stuff, uh, you know, give, helping people through through um, sudden deaths and you know drug overdoses and um, lots of car accidents. Just the just the normal bread and butter stuff, really. Yeah, you, I mean, you say normal bread and butter, but a lot of people listening. You know, you, you only ever turn up on the worst day of someone's life, don't you? Do you know what I mean? In a lot of instances. A lot of people, they don't understand, they don't get it. Do you know what I mean? They don't get what you see as a regular. What you see as, oh, it's just everyday sort of thing. Yeah, mate, he, mate, he got chopped up in his car. Oh, right, yeah, that's all right. And it, do you know what I mean? Do you, do you feel you sort of like look at the world a slightly different way to other people now, do you? Well, I think I did quite rapidly. I mean, it, when I was still attached to my tutor in the first six weeks, we had... Um, there was a car chase. So a traffic car was chasing this car that was travelling at over 80. Yeah. We were the car behind doing backup. And the car that was being chased crashed into a, um, a post box so hard that the post box was ripped out of the ground and I landed in a shop window. Wow. And then they went through and then into a wall. So pulling them out of that car, one of the one of them vomited and then died basically instantly. There was so there was all of those bodily fluids. Um, yes, there was there was pe- well, yeah. there was the smell of petrol, <laughs> uh, which is worrying. Yeah, but yeah, you, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But you've got to, you know, you know, you've got to get those people out. Yeah. And so that was my first experience of oh, well, you know, I've I've got 
I might have flipped a coin to get here, but I've got a duty here yeah. and, and I have to do what I need to do. And so that was one of the sort of first times I realised, yeah, I've, I've got to take this really seriously. Do you think that was, was sort of like a come to Jesus moment where you go, actually, this is policing now. This is, this is what I've got myself into. Yeah, it was when I realised I had to adopt a sense of duty. Yeah. I, I actually, you know, I, I wasn't just in here to do something different this this is yeah, you weren't is, just picking up your dough at the end of the week yeah this is about people's lives yeah and and, and it took that instance to make me realize that to be honest wow okay so how long did you spend as a normal cop i say a normal copper or sort of like on a beat copper out found in the streets i did three years uh about three and a half years before i started doing any covert work okay um so i moved from derby up, up to the north of the county in glossop and then weirdly i got an attachment to the drug squad which was quite strange because young cops who weren't qualified did you ask for that it was offered to me um which was strange because i i wasn't very good at it i wasn't very good at being a uniform car honestly i wasn't right. you know the first two years i almost got sacked <laughs> loads of times really i was too young too naive and i was like catching always trying to catch up you know yeah so to suddenly get this offer was fascinating. Which presumably was a senior type post. He's someone who's been in a little while, someone who might have shone at being a copper. Yeah, they didn't get off with the drug stuff. Yeah, they didn't normally do attachments because oh. to get into the drug squad, you had to go through, get qualified as a detective to have experience on CID, and then you'd move on to something okay. like that. So it was a bit strange. So you got this attachment. What what did that entail? What was your what was your work with them? What were you doing? It was primarily covert investigation and surveillance. Okay. Um, again, stuff that people take years to get qualified with. I was just tagging along, really. But really? I took, but I took to it fairly so a well. A lot of time behind the lens. A lot of time. Yeah, and car car surveillance as well. So in a in a convoy of six vehicles, so you you constantly rotating the vehicles. It's following the vehicles, so they don't notice anyone's following them. Yeah. And there's an extraordinary art to that work. You know, yeah. the, the people who do it well, it's 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 astonishing impressive yeah so i was sort of the foot um so by the side of the driver so the foot deployment so if they had to stop you get deployed on foot to follow someone on foot then that would be, that would be my job on the, that'd on the be you. I, I mean don't take this the wrong way you are quite a nondescript guy i mean i turn up and people see me 10 days before i get there like do you know what i mean oh he's champion do you know what i mean but you you i've got that gray man appearance about you do you know what i mean which is i suppose quite a bonus working in that sort of having to keep yourself out of the way and still managed to maintain a sort of presence behind someone as they were. Yeah, I mean, a lot of how you appear is body language, isn't it? Yeah. A, a lot of how, how, how you're, you're noticed and things. Um, but during, I mean, within about three weeks of that attachment, one of them just looked at me oddly one day and said, do you fancy having to go up buying some crack cocaine? I thought, well, that's not a question I was expecting. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm game for anything. Yeah. yeah. So they quickly set up, up a surveillance. So they had an observations point nearby to this um, particular address in Derby. They gave me 20 quid, told me what door to go to, and I went to knock on this door. Um, and this huge guy answered the door and he said, what do you want? And I said, I'll have a 20 pound stone, please. And he went, who are you? You're not a student, are you? I fucking hate students. <laughs> And at that moment, I thought, actually, I don't know who I am. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of a cover story. <laughs> who, who, who told me to? Who told me I'd need that? Anyway, I thought that'll do. Yeah, I'm a student. And he went, "Are you stupid? I've just told you I hate students." But then he found it funny and started laughing. And this one behind him was also laughing. So we got on all right. And he sold me the little twenty pound stone and gave him the money. And as I'm walking away, he said, "Hey, mate, you take care now. Don't get yourself arrested." Which I thought was nice. <laughs> uh, He's got your interests at heart, hasn't exactly, he? He, exactly. wants a, he wants another twenty pounds stone going your way tomorrow. Exactly. But <laughs> but um so I went back to the drug squad and I went, hey, there you go, I've got it. And the thing is, at that point in time, this is nineteen ninety three, at that point in time there was a huge amount of pressure on police to increase the arrests around drugs. Yeah. Massive pressure, massive political pressure. Um there was also a huge financial investment in um, in drugs policing, and it was made the number one priority by the pro by the Home Office. So there was suddenly a lot of pressure on the yeah. drug squads, which is why I got the attachment. Actually, just a quick question on this, right? This is a really bone question, right? And I'm I'm being naive, and you're who, who, where did the twenty quid come from? Could you go and sign for some dough to buy it? 
Yeah, it was a contingency so fund you, for, you, for covert you, policing. Your sergeant, yeah. went, your sergeant went, right, I've got a big old, there you go, son, go and get yourself a, a crack rock. Yeah, but it, <laughs> it's, it was just all signed. You know, there was um, uh, self-copying forms. There's like four sheets of the forms, okay. so one sheet goes to, you know, it, it was all... <laughs> it just makes you laugh that you've got to turn up with this £20 note, but it's not your £20 note. It's come from the system, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, God, <laughs> it, it, they'd find it from somewhere. I remember... I remember Walking out with five, four grand once for a, for a job later on. Really? And what happens? What happens? So you give this rock in. What yeah. do they do with the rock? Well, he goes straight into an evidence bag. Okay. Sealed up. Yeah. Um, you'd fill out the forms in order to submit it to the forensic laboratory, which was all run by the government then. Yeah. Uh, before they were privatized. Um, and it would be submitted with with the exhibit, and the lab would say what's in it. And presumably they had, they had a surveillance team on this geezer now. That was just a sort of like verification that he was flogging stuff and all that sort of caper. Yeah, because it becomes evidence. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's not just evidence of possession. Is, is, that, is that not setting, could that not be viewed as being setting him up a little bit? The fact that you've gone to get the, the fact that you've gone to sort of like, have you got any rocks, mate? Is that, would that be viewed as being you sort of like, I don't know, setting him up a little bit? I don't know. <laughs> Well, I'm playing um, devil's advocate on this one, by the way. I'm not trying to trip you up. Well, no, the because there there are um, there must be rules there, surrounding that. There are legal definitions and rules surrounding it. So, yeah. um, to to quote the instructions to an to an undercover officer is that you must not act as an agent provocateur. That is to say that you must not cause someone to commit an offence or an offence more serious than they would have already committed. Okay, uh, so you couldn't then goad him into something else that you probably wouldn't have done. Is what they're yeah, saying, basically. Yeah, if if he's if he's if he's only capable of selling you ten rocks, to then goad him into finding uh, a kilo, <laughs> would be would be setting him up as an agent provocateur. I have done that to someone, right? Okay. Actually, yeah, I yeah, have yeah, broken yeah. the rules and done that to someone. Okay, but uh, you're right. Doing uh, doing that would be breaking the breaking the rules. But the offence was laid on. He was all he was already ready to sell it to somebody. Yeah. yeah so yeah, it's yeah. A, so, so it's there, fair so. game. Okay. Essentially, cool. it's fair I've game. Got you. So. That was your first sort of like flurry into doing something face to face with someone who's actually doing something wrong. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to you know covertly, you know overtly arresting people. But this is now you're pretending I'm a I'm a student who's a bit of a scrot and I buy rocks and you and you're there. Yeah, exactly. And um, the thing is that that day changed the rest of my life because the drug squad were, were looking for ways to to more, to become more efficient and and to lock up more people. And this is a way of doing it, a cheap way of doing it. And so in no time, and it was pretty new. It was actually really rare to do that level of undercover work yeah. in this country. They'd done it in the States for decades, but in this country, it was the beginning of it, really. So I went from doing that one day to doing operations for a few weeks. And in no time at all, I was doing them for no less than six or seven months at a time. So it changed, changed my life, really. Okay, so when you say six or seven months at a time, are you then sort of like... You've got to stay away from certain things now, haven't you? So you can't just turn up at work at the police station in case someone sees you coming and going, can you? Presumably. So you're not going to have to be handled by somebody who is your sort of like, is that how it works? Yeah, so the way it developed um, after a few years, when it when it became always no less than six or seven months, uh, the operation would have was set up in a particular model. So the people who ran the operation, you'd have people doing certain roles. You'd have an intel officer, You'd have an exhibits officer, backup, senior investigating officer, all of your team around yeah. you. And I, I ended up working for the East Midlands Special Operations Unit, but doing operations nationally. Okay. So I would be loaned out to a constabulary who would have to provide all of this model, all of these uh, figures yeah. to fit that model of investigation. But during that time, they'd have nothing to do with normal policing. It's the jobs weren't, weren't run out of a police station; they were run out of like a rented farmhouse or yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So it yeah. was all. Quite secret. But presumably, you're not after the geezer that, that that drops you the bag. You want someone who's going to supply the geezer with the bag, or someone even further up the chain of command than him. Yeah, that's the idea. But um, do you start off then by going to the geezer with the bag to try and get a link into where it's all coming from? Yeah, I mean, after after a few years, it it, it became clear to me that the the most efficient thing I could do is to actually make myself out to be a problematic consumer. So I would act like a um, a problematic heroin user, problematic cocaine user, okay, a daily user. So I would mingle with the street community um, in the location that I'd go to. I'd get to know people hanging around in squats, the homeless people, and I would p portray myself to be the same kind of person. 
because they were using more drugs than anybody because they were having a hard time, right? Really yeah. hard time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loads of aid, yeah. loads of former military in that group of people, yeah. by the way, loads of people. So I would mix with them, hang out with them, and they would they the, they were the people who could actually get me introductions further up the, up the ladder. But to get in there and do a proper job with these people, right? Is there a stage where someone goes, there you go, son, you need some of that? Do you know what I mean? Have you taken it in the line of duty? I've never had to take heroin, right. I'm very pleased to say, because that would scare me a lot. Yeah. Um, never had to take crack. That wouldn't particularly worry me, but I'd never had to. But I once made a really bad mistake. Yeah. Really bad. Um, I was doing a sort of long-term infiltration of this pub in Leicestershire. It was a weird place. It's in the village of Whittick, but you had gangsters meeting from Nottingham, Derby and Leicester in, yeah. the, in this one pub. It was it was bizarre. All the clientele were criminals. <laughs> so I was hanging around in there, and um, the guy, one of the main targets that I'd got to know, who was doing antique burglaries, organised car thefts, like stealing tens of thousands of stuff a week. He was yeah. also a cocaine dealer. During that time, I'd made myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamines, right? And spoiler, I'm not. Yeah. So he came up to me one day and he said, Look, hey, mate, I've got a treat for you. And he held up this little bag with his toxic-looking pink goo in it. <laughs> it and I opened it up. It smelled like the, the urine from a glue-sniffing cat, like really vile, <laughs> right? I knew, it was, I knew it was strong amphetamine from the smell. But the trouble is... I'd got a momentary reticence kind of across my face. Yeah. Momentary. And he picked up on it because I saw the momentary suspicion across his face. Right, okay. And I so thought, now this, he's... it's a moment, right? Yeah, yeah, It's yeah, a yeah, moment. Yeah, and yeah. I know I've got to pour water on his suspicion quickly. Yeah. So I've got to show enthusiasm. So I knew I had to have it. So I dipped my finger in, got a lump, put it on my tongue, swallowed it. And he looked at me and said, you'll need more than that with your tolerance. So I dipped my finger in again and had another lump. And um, yeah, within about 15 minutes, like warm glow in my stomach, heart was pounding. I was high as a kite because I had no tolerance <laughs> to this stuff, right? None at all. I had to make my excuses and get out there and um, spoke to my cover officer, said, look, this has happened. Right, fine. Dictate me your evidence quick while you still got the brains. So I explained, you know, got that written yeah. down because I couldn't even write by that stage. I mean, I knew enough about the drug I haven't overdosed. I know you need to take a hell of a lot of amphetamine to actually cause yourself. But you a... had proper messed yourself up with but it. But it was not comfortable. Yeah. In fact, it was horrendous. It was really horrendous. At the time, the average amphetamine uh, deal that you'd buy was 5% pure. Right. This was 40%. It was really, really strong. And I had to get driven home. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't drive. Couldn't do the next, couldn't do the work the next day. In fact, I didn't sleep properly for three nights, but my house has never been so tidy. <laughs> you got proper busy. <laughs> You're not kidding. Yeah, no, I wouldn't, I will never repeat so to that. What, so you are, you're working undercover, right? At what lengths can you go? Because obviously you've got, you've got to be in a community and you've got to blend in with that community. You can't blend in with that community if you've got any traits of a policeman whatsoever, can you? So how do you go? How do you go about? You like norm? Would you speed in a car if you were driving with someone? Would you break small laws? Could you? Is there laws that you could break to sort of like put you on their side and prove who you, that you? How do you prove that you're not a copper? Oh yeah, um, I had great fun doing that. To be honest, yeah. uh, there was um, a guy I was getting to know in Nottinghamshire, who I was sort of wooing him and get getting really friendly with him because he he was on bail for dealing heroin for a gang that was a principal target of the operation. So it was really useful for me to get to know him. He could introduce me to people. Yeah. And he did introduce me. But while we, while I was getting to know him, I went shoplifting with him, which is fantastic fun. <laughs> you know, I mean, okay, you've got, I've got to get out a free jail card. I'm not yeah. going to get caught for it, but, but it was great fun, especially if you're working with someone else and you're taking it in turns to be lookout. Yeah. It's great fun. If you had have got rumbled shoplifting with him, what would have happened? Would they? Because he's obviously he's going to be in front of the beak on the Monday morning, isn't he? Or, or whatever it is. You know what I mean, in the next couple of days, he's going to be in front of the beak. Would you have to go in front of the beak? That would have been a policy decision based on the. Would they have had the capability of putting you in front of the beak as a sort of like show? Tell the yeah. beak, right? This one's a this one's a copper. You're going to give him the same as that one, I could which go... is which is a fine. Only this one ain't going to pay. Yeah, I could go through um, the court system, but the, I mean, the easiest way to do it is to slow it down because the operation's seven months and this is like a couple of months in. So you put him on remand and you, you put could, you on remand as well. And so you're both on remand. Well, I mean, I'd just get, I'd, I'd get bail. 
Right, you know, okay. I, yeah, yeah. I, so you both get bail, but you both get sort of like, yeah, right, you're going to have to come back to court and say... And then we, there's the this way, ways and means of slowing down the court system. Okay. But if necessary, if I had to do the court, then I'd do it. But it's just easier and more practical to just slow things down, really. Okay. So what's the closest you've come to being properly rumbled by these people? Oh, a few, well, a few times, but the worst stands out because it's the worst by a long way. So when I was in Leicester, um, I'd been buying heroin from this guy for months. The first time I bought off him was literally six months before this point, but it was coming to the end of the operation. And, and this particular guy was a, was a very well-connected gangster. So it was like, it was just pure luck that I'd managed to score off him so early on because most of the, every time I tried to speak to him after then he was really hands off because he was a step up from the, away from the street so I thought how am I going to get him on camera because we had no corroborating evidence about him so I thought well and he's really into his clothes let's get some counterfeit clothes and I'll sell him some counterfeit clothes but at least I've caught him on camera yeah. and then the evidence I can say that's the man I bought from six months ago right yeah simple you think so I got these really good uh, counterfeit Stone Island jackets. They were great. You still got any? I've still got one, actually. Oh, would it fit me? <laughs> <laughs> so, and they, and they you know, all, all of these people, they love Stone Island, Stone Island stuff at the time, especially the jumpers and stuff. I traded in some of them sometimes. But anyway, phoned him up, told him I got these jackets and arranged to meet him in this car park that was near to the inner ring, ring road in Leicester. So it was sort of in the middle of the city, but actually quite secluded because it's an yeah. empty car park. And he turned up with two of his mates. So I knew him well enough and he trusted me. Yeah. But his two mates had never met me before. So he turns up and he says, all right, you just want to sell me these or do you want something? And I'm thinking, well, I've only ever bought heroin off him. If I buy crack off him, he'll get another 12 months in prison. So I says, well, if you carry him white, I'll have a 20 stone off you, right? And he says, fine. And he brought out this massive block of crack. Like you remember VHS videos. It's like bigger than a VHS video. Wow. It's a huge amount of crack, yeah. okay? So he sits in his car in the driver's seat and he's cutting it with a little blade. And his mates are looking at me and one of them suddenly pushes me against this metal railing at the end of the car park and starts searching my clothes. And I says, what are you fucking doing picking up my, my clothes? And he's, you know, and this is not James Bond tech, right? Yeah. If I was wearing this uh, blue denim jacket with a metal stud button yeah, with a hole in the middle with a camera in it. When he found that camera, there was no doubt what was winking up at him, right? Yeah. No doubt at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You couldn't pass it off as a no. anything else. And he said, he is as well. He's fucking 5-0, man. He's fucking 5-0. So I know, because it's a few metres behind where he, his mate sat in the car cutting the crack up. And I know the moment that he manages to communicate what he's found successfully to him, I'm done, right? I know the reputation of these people. They're not nice people. So I thought, Done as in someone's going to proper run you through or you're going to get I, I think, uh, yeah, I instantly knew there was a, a serious risk of them killing me. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, just to clarify that. Just, just to clarify, yeah, yeah. yeah. So This is quite a big deal the next couple of seconds on this, on this in particular. So what I, so what I knew I had to do <coughs> is to slow down that communication, right? Yeah. So I just launched into a torrent of abuse. I says, what are you fucking doing to picking up my fucking clothes? It's not even my fucking jacket. What are you fucking on about? What are you doing picking up my clothes? I didn't let him get a word in edgeways. This had the added advantage is this really shocked him a bit and made him step back and doubt, doubt himself because it wasn't yeah. the reaction he was expecting. So I just kept up this abuse and he's like, what? what? I, but, what? So he's doubting himself. So I'm taking advantage of this confusion by being extra aggressive with him. Yeah. Bearing in mind, he's about six foot three and spends all day in the gym. <laughs> all, like all, all he's day. He's a proper like, lump. Like literally all day in the gym. That's That's the, you know, all three of them were like that. Yeah. So I grabbed the other jacket off the other one and started folding it up slowly and put it in this plastic container that it came in, plastic bag, really slowly. Because, you know, you run away from wolves, they'll chase you. Yeah. Right? So I'm moving really slowly and I'm starting to walk slowly, but all this time I'm not letting up on the abuse and I'm upping it up, up, in, it, up in the ante a bit. You fucking picking it. What the fuck are you? Who are you? Fucking picking at my clothes. It's not even my jacket. I kept saying that as well. I start walking slowly across the car park. It's not even my jacket, just in case you find it. And it uh, my mate has a camera in his jacket. <laughs> I know where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It's not even my jacket. I t I t in fact, I said I, I, I nicked it off Jackie this morning. <laughs> Jackie's jacket. 
So I walked halfway th- across the car park and I'm thinking, well, I might even survive this. I don't know. And then I hear some running behind me. I'm thinking there's I can one set of footsteps. If I can spin round, punch him once and then start running. Yeah. That was my plan. Turn round and it's my mate who's just been cutting the crack up. He, his mate who's found the camera is stood by the car still shouting at him. And he's, and, but he's there with a the crack and he says, oh, don't you want this ting? Oh, don't mind my mate, he's just a dickhead. I thought, I says, yes, he is a dickhead. Yes, he is a dickhead and he's been picking up my clothes and I don't know what the fuck he's on about. Anyway, he says, yeah, I love the, I love the ting. So I did, gave him 20 quid note, all perfectly framed on the camera, uh, the handover. <laughs> <laughs> I put it, in my, put it in my little key pocket in my jeans and carried on walking. At this point, his mate's screaming at him, saying he's fucking heat, man. He's fucking 5-0. So anyway, he went back to the car, and I keep starting to speed up a little bit, but I'm still walking. And then the car revs, and the wheels spin, and it's coming for me across the car park, and I think, now it's time to run. Now it's but, I, but I was quite near the exit then, so I got to the exit, and where the car park exit comes onto at the road it's a dual carriageway yeah and a pavement on the left hand side of the the road so i i'm running at this pavement but because the dual carriageway comes up to a roundabout there's steel railings to protect the you know as you do around a roundabout to protect the pavement and i sprint and i just get to the steel railings as the cars mounted the pavement coming up after me on the pavement trying to run me over yeah and i look round just as i got to it and i'm it must have been 2 meters behind me so it, it almost got to me. So then I went a bit further. The car couldn't follow me onto there. So I went back to walking and and still doing body language, like, don't know what you're on about sort of thing. And But from where I was positioned, I could actually get to a pedestrian part actually quite easily. So we separated quite easily because yeah. I, I could go towards the pedestrian area of the city and they went round the roundabout a couple of times and then drove off. So I went back to the safe location, uh, debriefed the team, told him the car registration number and the description. The Intel guy went out to do the research, came back quite quickly laughing. And he says, I'd, I don't know why they didn't just shoot you because there's loads of Intel about them having a gun in that car. And, you know, we all laughed, like, <laughs> like hy- hysterically. That was like the funniest thing anyone had ever heard, <laughs> it, which is funny what you laugh at, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Times, that's times like that's that. the way of, it's a, just a coping mechanism in the world that you're in, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. Any other any other close ones? Have you ever, have you ever had to get in a row with anybody or a ruck or a, you know any any tear ups or? Not really. I mean, there's loads of times when I've thought, God, is it going to come to that? Yeah. You know, is it? Um, but I mean, I, I sometimes had a I, I once had a cover story that I was on bail for a GBH where I was protecting the the female operative that I was working with. You know, that's the reason I was with her, my girlfriend. And yeah. I helped to split up from her boyfriend and punched him and all that kind of thing. But that was the only time I ever had a reputation of, or tried to have a reputation of being What physical. would be the policy, say, for instance, if you're in a pub, right, and you're, you're tailing someone and you've got to be in there because you're going to be buying stuff and all that sort of thing, and I'll get that. If you see other stuff going on in that pub, like, say, for instance, you witness a, a good old tear-up and someone gets filled in in the pub, which does happen around these people quite a lot, do you know what I mean? They're filling, they're, it's, it's quite often it happens around these people. He ain't paid his money, his money wasn't there on time, he hasn't got the drugs, whatever. What would you be, what, what, what could you step in or would you sort of like, oh? Well, there's, lot, there's always lots of judgment calls there and you, you yeah. read it as, it as it's happening. Um and there's have seen people in been received of violence and I've seen people have a drug overdose, potential drug overdose. Cause even though I'm working undercover, my first duty is still the preservation of life. Yeah. So there could be the judgment where I step out of role even, potentially, if someone's life's at stake. Preservation of life is always the number one priority of, of a police officer. That never changes. Yeah. Um but it's a judgment call and you have to read it and read it carefully and hope you don't make a mistake, really. Cause you know, I saw someone having um a really bad reaction to a ketamine tablet and it it was getting close whether you know whether i what i do you know whether i step out of how my role might might act but it was fine and i've seen people god i've seen people dropped for 10 pound debt it was at the same pub where i had to take the amphetamine actually someone owed that guy that yeah. that person who gave me the amphetamine 10 quid he didn't pay him up when he said 
and he got one of his hang one of his uh, one of his lieutenants to come over and punch uh, him. Really, punched him, and I thought he, he was literally floored. And when he hit the floor, he didn't seem to be conscious. <laughs> you know, and I've dealt with one punch manslaughters as a detective. It happens. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, it does. That, yeah, that was, a friend of mine went inside for it. <laughs> yeah, so that was a moment. That was uh, just one of those uncomfortable moments, really. But it was fine. A few seconds later, he was all right. He was up, and he was so. Uh, just how much can you take before you sort of like say oh, I've had enough of this? Did you did you get to that stage where you thought right I can't do this anymore? That's a complicated question. because to be honest, because having been not that good at uniform policing, to suddenly find myself in this world and increasingly realizing that, okay, I'm actually quite good at this. Yeah. This suits me. You know, this suits my personality. Um, I could think quickly. You know, in all of these scenarios, I never had a problem thinking quickly. And I don't know what you're like, because you, I mean, you've got a military background. It'd be interesting yeah. to put your opinion on this, actually. Unusually, because I've talked to lots of different people about this, when I had an adrenaline moment when I felt at risk, I yeah. felt I had all the time in the world to think, like everything slowed down. Yeah. Um, and it felt quite a powerful feeling, like oh, I can I can cope with this, and, and everything feels slow. And you know, do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. I, I my missus pointed it out at me a few weeks ago. There was a car come across the road, come across the front of us, and I didn't do anything initially just watched where it was going and then literally drove around and carried on never even missed a beat my missus goes i'd have swerved or i'd have probably pulled the steering wheel i wanted to, you know and i don't i i you know i have this thing in me whereby you know even in just a normal fight i can step back and look where's it going to come from oh here it is bang here yeah, block bang do you know what i mean even if i get filled in but at least i see it coming do you know what i mean so i have this thing whereby and i think you must have the same thing there yeah and where, I've, I've... Where adrenaline or whatever it puts it into that perspective where you don't just flap, run, fight or flight. You're actually there. Yeah, that'll do. Exactly. It's it's where adrenaline becomes useful to your thinking process, yeah. isn't it? And 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 I'm definitely someone who had who had that anyway. Uh and I really enjoyed the work. And I enjoyed the times when it was risky. Yeah. You know, I was buzzing after that car tried when they tried to kill me with that car. I was <laughs> genuinely I was buzzing. I was buzzing for days. And and also it's it was a I was a young man and it was an ego boost to me. Yeah. I'm thinking, wow, I'm someone who can cope with that. Yeah. And that sort of changes your sense of identity, doesn't it? I'm someone who can cope with it. Did you get to sort of like, with some of these jobs, would you be there on the day when they actually cracked them open? Do you know what I mean? Where you said, right, I followed someone, I've been with them. Would you ever be in that position where the guy that you've been following would be stood in front of you and he's, sort of like, he's looking at you and saying, he was a grass. Have you ever... No, no, I would always be out the way. They'd always get so out I'd, the way. I'd, I'd, I'd never be involved. You'd never get in... that Hollywood moment where you stand over and you go, it was me all the time, son. No, 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 <laughs> I, I, no. Because it's important in the interview process to be able to reveal your hand slowly. Yeah. Um, so the interviewers, you know, that they would love to, that it was important for them to plan their interview and, and it not be known who I was until it suited, suited them, really. Okay, so you'd be kept right out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes, were, I mean... If you were there, you'd be ignored or you'd manage to run away somewhere else on it. Yeah, and also, as as the years went on, the jobs got more and more complicated and more and more people uh, were the targets. You know, they had as many as 96 people arrested in one one job. It, the, so the enforcement side of it became huger and huger as as, as time went on. So did your modus operandi stay the same throughout, act like the dependent drug user, all that sort of stuff, or did you develop your own sort of like different methods of getting into these people? I adapted it according to the intelligence of the target. So sometimes I'd be, I'd, I'd make myself out to be a regular heroin user, but a, more of a traveling thief. Yeah. So someone who could trade in stolen property. And that was sometimes a useful, um, a useful reputation to have that would help me get climb up the chain. Did you have stuff that you could take off the shelf to prove the capability and stuff like that? Do you know what I mean? So if it's not good me going, yeah, I'm a traveling thief, but I haven't thieved anything. Do you know what I mean? You've got to be a travelling thief and going, oh, by the way, do you want to buy this six kilo lump of meat that I've got? Do you know what I mean? I would get the... For if, when I was pretend, pretending to be a travelling thief, I would get my backup team to source me specific things. Okay, so uh, if someone asked you for something, well, can you lick as a whatever it would be? And you'd go, you'd have to come away and do it. Yeah, if, I'd get it, I'd get it have, sourced. You'd, you'd yeah, have yeah. to put up. And there'd be a budget for that as well, would there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, whatever I needed, really. Whatever I needed. Have you got any examples of stuff like that, have you, you can give us? Um... I mean, I suppose the example really was when I was asked to 
investigate the Burger Bar Boys. Um, I'd been doing undercover work for, I don't know, maybe 11 years by that, 12 years, something like that. Yeah. Quite a long time. Um, and the reason I was asked to do it is because they were becoming a significant problem to the community where they'd taken over the supply in Northampton. They're a sort of legendary um, Birmingham gang. And they tried to get uh, close to them already with 200 other undercover cops. But by this point, I'd sort of become a bit of a troubleshooter. So, you know, I was given the more difficult yeah. jobs. Just, you know, it's just practice in it. So I, I paid attention to the attempts that the previous people had done and realized I just had to build up a very sophisticated legend which meant actually having a genuine rep, genuine reputation as a trader of stolen goods with people that I could foster that reputation. So I'd be trading in bottles of spirits, um, but I would have to find the people who would buy that stuff. Yeah. Right. So that became part of the network that I could rely on for, the, for my legend. So I was, but I mean, one of the major things I was doing was trading in children's clothes. Okay. Because there's always a market for children's clothes because there's always, there's, you know, poor people need to buy clothes yeah. for their kids. There's be designer type gear they, as well, would it? And they grow up so fast, up right? Yeah. So, so there was always, so I just built up a, a trait. I mean, it's not necessarily an exciting story, but you know, no, I, I think I, it's I, intriguing. I, I'm absolutely fascinated by it. Do you know what I mean? But because I'd got that reputation, um, when the burgers were asking questions, you know, who is this guy? There was some substance that people could say. Don't be an easy way. They were the thief, quite obviously. Do you know what I mean? Did, 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 did you have bogus names? Did you did you want to be known by your own name? And I say that because if if I say, for instance, say right, call me Malcolm. I'm going to be Malcolm for this job. You could probably sit there and go, Malcolm, Malcolm, Malcolm. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm Malcolm. Do you know what I mean? That would be a giveaway for me. Do you know what I mean? Did you change your name for the for the jobs? Okay, so. I'll refer a little bit back to one of your other questions first, because okay. you asked me, you know, about um, what what was my limit? How could I cope with all this stuff? Yeah. And, and early on, I loved it, but that changed over time. And one thing someone, no one ever told me about was PTSD. Yeah. No one ever told me that this was a possible issue. So by the time I did an operation in Nottinghamshire that I mentioned, I was I wasn't enjoying it anymore. And at the end of each operation, I was I would just be collapsed. I wouldn't be able to wake up, like the sensation of not being able to wake up for weeks afterwards. Um, so I wasn't enjoying it as much, and I was being driven by a sense of duty more than anything else. Yeah. And I was getting through it. For the Burger Bar Boys, I'd had some issues with police corruption, which we might come to in a bit if you want to discuss that. Absolutely, kind of I do. So we'll we'll be a bit topsy turvy here, yeah. but but we'll stick with the with the question you asked me. Yeah, because I'd had that experience with police corruption to the point that I did not trust my colleagues. Now I'm sure you can appreciate if you don't trust the people who've got your back, things are harder. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, if you're if you're working in an environment where by any given point somebody could run you over with their car, you'd like to know there's going to be someone coming and help you. Exactly. Yeah. And I I didn't I didn't trust my colleagues. I wow. didn't. I, I, and it was hard to try and get to know them to even trust the new ones. So yeah. I had a sort of um, fuck you to the universe moment, right? Yeah. When the Burger Bar Boys job, when I was choosing my pseudonym, the name I was going to use, I decided to use the name Woody, which right. was almost identical to my nickname of Woodsy. Yeah. And the reason for that was just like, well, if the universe is going to get me, you can come and get me. It was a sort of bravado thing, yeah. if you know what I mean. Like a real to yeah. to sort of uh, to fire myself up, yeah, because I felt that vulnerable. I felt really vulnerable, so doing it was like my just you know fire myself up. But so that was when I used the name similar to my own name. But the previous jobs, um, I mean, the job before that, I called myself Cookie, All right? Because everyone loves cookies, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was just that kind of psychological approach to the name that I that yeah I would something use. that's going to sort of like fit in with. Yeah, yeah fit in, you. make make it easier to make friends with people. It's got to be memorable, you know. So the first time I meet people, I want them, I want to make them smile, and I want them to remember that it's Cookie who made them smile. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. So you become so when they ask, who is he? Oh, he's Cookie. He's Cookie the thief. He's a yeah. bloody good thief. Yeah, gets yeah. what you like. Yeah. Corruption. You've said corruption. The word corruption. That's pricked my ears up. That is the first time you realised that was going on. When did when did you get a sort of like sniff that actually 
not everybody's doing the same sort of job as you are. Right. Bear with me, because there's a little bit of a long <coughs> a response to oh, this. I ain't going right? nowhere, mate. I'm going nowhere. So, for the kind of work I used to do, it, it, the model of how it was done developed over time in response to the problems that were presented to the, to the work, right? Yeah. So, eventually, the absolute model that had to be followed by everybody is this sort of cell-like structure with an exhibit software and the... Uh, Intel officer and the senior investigating officer. It all had to be cooking, as I've described to you already. Yeah. Had to be in a secret location, no connections with normal policing, all of that kind of thing. Bef my, the day before I got there, that team would all be sat down and they would be given what, a lawful order. Now, a lawful order is a big deal in the police. It, you, you know, you pay attention to it. And this was, a, this was a written lawful order that everyone had to sign receipt of. And that order was, you must not ask the undercover operative his real name, anything personal, anything about his background, where he's from, or anything. You will be disciplined if you do. Yeah. That's to protect me. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. That's yeah, to protect that. me from yeah. corruption. Now, bear in mind, that only happens for drugs investigations. That doesn't happen for any other kind of policing. I mean, maybe, maybe terrorism, but no, not really, because yeah. we don't have terrorist spies in the cops. Yeah. That's because of the threat of corruption in policing. So the existence of that structure yeah. is in itself admission of the problem of corruption, that it exists. And corruption being in people taking backhanders, people making a dipping into the stuff that's being sort of like toed and froed. What's the corruption element of this? I'm a spy in their camp. Yeah. They have spies in our camp. Okay. Because organised crime is ah, very, so, very rich. So you get, you get a policeman, perhaps, and I'm just going to suggest this, throw this out there, as a, who might be struggling with his bills, for want a better word, gets a bit of wind of someone on the other side, says, I'll tell you what, I can help you out a little bit here, son. And then his bills get paid and you get dobbed in. There are all manner of ways in which people get corrupted, but the corruption exists, is endemic, and can't be defended against. Yeah. So on that operation, there were so many hints of it. I remember going out one day and the person who I'd been cultivating, I mentioned to you, who was on bail for heroin dealing, I'd been cultivating him and he was, it, it, I was getting him to do what I needed, yeah. manipulating him. It was working out well. Then he got arrested. And I thought, oh, damn it, he's not going to get bail. Not with his record. He's already on bail. Yeah. So I'm going to have to start working on someone else now. And it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Anyway, I was stood in the town of Mansfield speaking to three of his mates. And then suddenly I see him. He's walking towards us looking sheepish and a bit stressed. And I thought, how the hell's he got bail? And as he walks up, his mate says, how the hell have you got bail? Yeah, so they're thinking grass straight away, aren't they? So he came up to us and he says, well, mate, when I'm in the, in the police cell, these two detectives came in into the cell and said, you can either give us some information or we'll let it be known that you have given us information. That's your choice. So I said, wow, man, that's some nasty blackmail, that is. So what did you do? He says, well, I can't tell them anything, can I? Because I don't know if they're working for the same person I work for. So I'm thinking, okay. So that's a hint of what's going on here. So for a few weeks later, four and a half months into the job, that guy manages to introduce me to a lieutenant of the main target of the operation. The main, one of the, well... One of the pe people of interest in the operation, which was Colin Gunn, it was one of his sub-dealers. So I got introduced to him the first time, and he turned up in a car with his 12-year-old son in the car. And it was weird. They were dressed identically. It's like his son was a mini-me. Same tracksuit, <laughs> same gold chain, same shaved head, same tracksuit, uh, same trainers. And he opened the car door, got me close, and stuck a knife into my groin which is really off-putting in a conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's really not, quite off-putting. It's not, off sort of like, it's it's not, not a friendly thing to do, is it? It's not comfortable. <laughs> so, so he's got this knife in my groin, and he's interrogating me, asking me who I am, who I know, who's brought me. And I'm saying, well, he's vouched for me, man. You know you know, I know him. And anyway, we had the conversation. His son's looking on like, you know, Ooh, what does daddy do for Go on, dad, poke him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so eventually he sold to me. So that was quite a long day at the office, so to speak. It's quite a difficult day. Yeah. That was in the evening. I had an early morning briefing the next morning. Before the briefing, I was told that two of the team had gone off sick and that they'd got two temporary replacements. Now, I wasn't happy with this because that's not the way it's meant to work. I was introduced to the first one. I had no problem with him. Introduced to the second, and as I shook his hand, just the hairs went up on the back of my neck. Instinctively, this guy was wrong, 
right? Yeah. Wrong. You know, in hindsight, I tried to think about with the body language what it was that spooked me, and it was like the way he looked to the floor, to the to the side as he shook. But I don't know. It's hard to really quantify specifics. He's just got language. the wrong and monitor on, and he's, he's, he's that one. To the point yeah. that I went straight to the boss and said, boss, there's no way I'm working today with that guy on the team. I'm not doing it. I don't trust him. Simple as that. And he was great. He, he didn't even blink an eye. He says, fine. We'll exclude them both. We'll not tell them why. They don't know anything about the job. They've just been told to turn up here. Um, I know it's not the right way to do this job anyway. Um, we'll, we'll bin them off. They'll never know anything about it. I was happy, right? Out of my head. 12 months later, when Colin Gunn was brought down, not by my job, but by a, a, a separate job, yep. by some hard-working Nottinghamshire cops, he was brought down. It turned out that this cop I'd taken an exception to, a guy called Charlie Fletcher, was an employee of Colin Gunn. Wow. He'd been paid to join the police. He wasn't corrupted when he was in the police. He was paid to join. He paid to join the police. Paid that to is join a the process police. enough, isn't it, to get yeah. someone in the back door? He'd been in the police for seven years by the time he was caught. And, and he was as bent as a nine bob note. He was paid £2,000 a month on top of his police wages, plus bonuses for good information. <laughs> now, in the debrief for this with senior cops, they said to me, well, you know, look, Woodsy, of course this happens. We know this happens. With this much money involved... How can it not happen? So, and I've spoke to many senior cops, both in this country and around the world since, and there is a general acceptance and understanding that the power of the wealth of drugs organised crime has caused endemic corruption and that there is really not much we can do about it. If we put these safeguards in place, like the models of how we investigated yeah. things, can't protect against that. Can't. So this guy actually joined the police. So, yeah. Have you got any examples of someone who's been turned whilst they've been in? You know what I mean? So someone who joined up with, genuinely with all the right reasons and then sort of like, oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, 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 I'll take a few quid out of this one. God, there's, there's so many. I mean, there's Operation <laughs> so Type. Many. Yeah, there's Oper I mean, I am aware of a, few, of a few, but it's really sophisticated because I speak to cops about the way that this corruption works all over the world. and. Yeah. There's a sort of standard model is you get someone embedded like like you know you pay them to join and you keep but you keep them safe because you use them as a method to corrupt other people who are more expendable. So you can find out things about them, blackmail them. You can get them to do one thing and then black use that to blackmail them to do more. And you, so the people that the cops that might get caught, the person that's actually help corrupt them as if they're the, a corrupt asset that organized crime has they they stay there so it's really sophisticated yeah and it, it and sounds it, really complicated as well doesn't it? So and I, it can and it can be sophisticated yeah. because they've got more money than we are yeah or drugs organized crime in, the, in this country the drug markets are worth 10 billion one estimate is 10 billion a year it, you can't defend against that you really can't i mean there's a uh, operation tiberius a study of uh about i think it's the boroughs, which is about uh, just less than half of the Met, the London police. Yeah. That there was loads. I think I think there's something like 30 corrupt cops identified in that. And a mate of mine who's part of my organisation, Leap UK, um, goes by the pseudonym of Frank Matthews. He was uh, a whistleblower for corruption in the Met. And he says, when he read Tiberius, because we've both got copies of it, saw copies of it, he says, well, yeah, they are, but they've missed the load that I know about. Um, and when he was whistleblowing about corruption, that was the first, and he's worked investigating organised crime his whole career. Yeah, That was the point when his life was at risk. And he had to go into witness protection to protect him from the corrupt cops. Yeah, because now he's got enemies everywhere, hasn't he? He's got yeah. enemies on that side, enemies on that side. They get, if they've got, if they've got, presumably if they've got corrupt corruption going on within the police force, there would also be an element of that that probably re replicates itself in the prison service as well. Oh, of course. There so, isn't, there is not. So there's, 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 there's you ain't, you ain't never going to be untouchable, are you, is what I'm saying? No, no, exactly. I mean, you, you, there isn't a drug free prison in the world. No, uh, at all. You know, I don't and know. That, I've sat in Winchester watching them take it. Like, you know what I mean? so, and, that, <laughs> and that's not because they've, they've trained pigeons or they've got drones, right? Yeah. This is, this is corruption. Now, I, I, I should always clarify when I'm talking about corruption like this because. You know, my many colleagues who work hard 
and put their lives on the line feel offended that I'm yeah. pointing this out. But it's a tiny minority of people who are corrupt, and that's no reflection on the hard pe- people who No, are, who because that's how I've got tremendous respect for the police, and I've got tremendous respect for the for, for, for coppers that I know, do you know what I mean? But... But we have to face up to the truth. Yeah, 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 of this. yeah. yeah, yeah. You're we have to, and, you know, and, and it's policy. It's, it's policy that's caused this, because this doesn't happen in legal markets. It right. Doesn't doesn't happen in legal markets. So, you wanted to talk to me about PTSD, and you, you, you did you suffer with PTSD yourself? You were saying toward, towards the end of your career, were you suffering with a bit of PTSD? I had a bit of a breakdown, if that's the right way. It's a horrible term, but I suppose you, it's accurate. Um, near the end of my career, when I was totally disillusioned with what I was doing. I realised that everything I was doing was only causing harm in yep. drug investigations. And there was genuine, genuinely no benefits to what I was doing. And it was causing harm to vulnerable people. It was sharpening the sort of organised crime, increasing the violence in the streets, that kind of thing. So I had that disillusionment combined with the creeping symptoms of PTSD, which I didn't know was PTSD at the time. That's right. Yeah. I, I speak to so many people who, who, who've suffered with it, who whilst they were serving all the periods, had no clue that they were doing it. Do you know what I mean? Or had it. I had no idea, you know, like emotionally distant and then the sleep problems and just the depression, anxiety, all of the, I had all of them and all of those symptoms gathering. And as is usually the case in this country, it took me uh, seven years to get diagnosed. You know, I, I lose track of how many doctors, psychiatric nurses, therapists, three psychiatrists, um, but before I was finally diagnosed, um, and I have complex PTSD, also a feature of that is moral injury as well, which, you know, being military, you're probably, probably aware of as well. So I still suffer from it. Diagnosis helps because you know how to manage it once you've been diagnosed and you can do your reading, you can speak to people. Yeah. Um, I'm going through a particularly good period of time at the moment, so I'm managing it quite well. Um, but it's just you always have to be prepared that it might turn dark again. And yeah, it's a roller coaster. As long, yeah, it, as long it, as you're ready, roller coaster, as yeah. long as you're ready for that, um, and remember that if you do, you, you can come out the other. You, you always come out the other side, and you can do it. Yeah. that's the way of keeping positive, isn't it? Absolutely, and uh, you've got to search for the positives as well. When you when you hit those negatives, you've got to look for it. You know, yeah. I, I I always say, you know, when I, when the, when I wound up in Winchester that first night. In my cell, I looked in the mirror and I spoke to myself and said, "You are an absolute twat, mate." Do you know what I mean? And I had this sort of like come to Jesus with myself, but at least I took ownership of it. And then I worked out there's a problem here. Now I can start doing something about it. But you have to take that ownership of what you, where you are. Do you know what I mean? Before you can acknowledge it and do something about it, or you won't know. Yeah, you do, you do. Uh, but for me, information was information about it and understanding what was going on was the key thing for me. Yeah, really. and it's not, it's not fast enough in this country not fast enough it's very difficult because there is an element especially while people are still serving or you know still on the beat or whatever they're doing because they don't they fear for the fact that it's going to have an, an impact on their position or place within whatever it is they're doing do you know what i mean so for instance for you it might have been get him out of that job that he really enjoys do you know what i mean because we don't have him in there and you'll be thinking oh well, I, don't, well I won't say nothing I'll be all right. do you know what i mean and then you're not all right here no no that's right but then again i should have been snatched out of that job Years before. I mean, I, I stopped enjoying it years before, but I was doing it because I thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah. And then suddenly I realised it wasn't the right thing to do. That's that's quite a lot to face up to. Do you think it impacted your performance at all? Or do you think you were still just as good at the job, but it's just you weren't enjoying it? I was better because, like most people in any role, we're always seeking to improve, aren't we? Yeah. And I didn't stop trying to improve and I didn't stop reflecting on my performance and working out how you know how to keep developing and so I was still still developing and getting better at it um not least of which that every year I did it it got more dangerous as well stakes were raised all the time because the first you know I described to you the first time I bought crack from that guy and he says you 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 know be be careful don't get arrested that was easy because he didn't know I was could be a cop but of course, the longer that people like me are on the streets, the more the violence increases. Yeah, and that's presumably they're now looking for signs of you being working for the other side and all that sort of stuff. And there's massive, there must be massive paranoia with some of those people. Oh, absolutely. Because not only yeah. they're doing the gear as well themselves, isn't they? Do you know what I mean? Which makes you paranoid in some instances, doesn't it? So they must be absolutely, it must be bonkers. Oh, absolutely. Yes, they, they were paranoid and they would, you know, 
there was uh, they went through a period of time where undercover operatives were being punched. First first time they'd meet a, um, a regional dealer, and then just sit back and wait. Their belief was that if they punched them, then the backup would come and come along, and they don't mind getting done. So that was that was the litmus test for you as an operator of being. Yeah, they, they they thought, well, I don't mind getting arrested for punching someone. That is bonkers, isn't I don't it? mind. At least I've not supplied Class yeah, A. Yeah, he hasn't got me stash and me cash and me, he's got the leg up to the next level and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, it never happened to me, but it happened to people I knew. And, and we, how do they deal with that? They just sort of take it, punch them back or? Well, if it was me, my instruction to, to my, I mean, I I was a pain in the arse to my, any team I work for, because I refused to have the backup anywhere near me. Yeah. So, th- in theory, right, the model is you have to have two backup ready to rescue you from something. But I said, I don't want you even in the yeah, same town as me. Like because... taking a camera crew with you, innit? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you don't so... need that. Do you? No, because <laughs> you, then I have, doing. I have to think about their behaviour as well as my own. Yeah. And I can't account for their behaviour. So I said, I don't want you. So it didn't make any difference to me, really. But if they were nearby, I would say, well, look, I can take a punch. Let's, you know, it's not, don't worry about it. Or would you... Wind one back into him? Would that be acceptable? It, it wouldn't have been my role. My role at that point would have been more subservient. Okay. So it wouldn't have been appropriate. So it would have been sort of like, oh, what do you do that for, mate? Type yeah. thing. Yeah. Leave it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, that, 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 that just, that's just honking, isn't it? And th- would you brief like young lads going in, you know, after yourself, you know, you must have had other operators that you've spoken to go, you're likely to get a punch in the head there, son. Um, well, I helped design the training because when I first okay. did it, but we weren't trained. So I was doing it for Yeah, four... you went straight off the beat, didn't you? Yeah. Sort of like plucked off the street. The next minute they're going, right, down you go. So there you go, here's 20 quid. <laughs> so we, I'd done it. I was doing it for four years. And then, of course, they wanted to expand it because yeah. it was successful. And I helped design the training for others. And I did lots of the training courses as well. So, yeah, I would talk them through it, the pitfalls. But <laughs> I was always told by uh, a couple of the... The sergeants from MSU, don't tell them that one. Don't tell them what happened there. We want them to get through this. You don't want to put them off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did so you get, I was always did you get banned people from who t- sort of like, I was going to ask you that next. People would take up this training and then go, I'll tell you what, no, not for me. Yeah. What was, uh, your, what was your sort of like, what was your select? It must have been it was like a selection process, was it? Or, you know, would... there was a selection process, an interview process later on. Certainly later on, it was quite detailed. But I mean, most of the courses, only two out of 12 people would pass. Okay. Uh, and bosses would be really frustrated with the low pass rate. But genuinely, you couldn't let most people out. You couldn't. No, in all, because in it must countries. be so easy to mess that up. Yeah, because you think they're just going to get themselves killed, you know. And the biggest failure, really, was just males who were too cocky. Yeah. Who thought that the way to talk the way through anything was, was strutting and being... They were just going to strut straight into the middle of this gang with a bit of East London tutting and hoofing yeah. and talking and chatting. O- overt ego is not the way to go when, yeah, when, when yeah, you meet yeah, when yeah, you yeah. meeting no, you've got to be when you're meeting organised crime. You've got to be almost Mr. Grovel, haven't you? You've got to be all. Oh. It's the right. It's the right yeah. tone. It's the right level. Yeah, but yeah. Gen, you know, yeah, you, you but you don't you don't big yourself up. You don't strut. That's no. for sure. So listen, you said to me right at the very beginning before we got on air that you had a something you wanted to plug. Yeah. So. We've talked about PTSD, and that's yeah. a good segue into this. Yeah. Um, so my organisation, the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, uh, or LEAP UK in the UK, we're, LEAP, we're uh, active in Europe as well, and I'm on the board for the organisation in the USA. Okay. We're a drug law reform organisation, essentially. That's that's our main campaigning point. And what we want to do is to, we, we want to legally control all of the drug supply to take the power away from organised crime. To tackle the you know what? I was going to actually ask you where you stood on legalizing drugs. So this is this is this is music to my ears. You're answering my questions before I've even started. Well, I I, I am literally a full time activist. Okay, because I've said it for years. Sell it at the chemist. Yeah, Do you know what I mean. Sell it at the chemist. There you go. Packet of heroin because he's going to take it anyway, isn't he? Exactly. He or she. Exactly. Do you know what I mean, they're going to take it anyway. And if someone's using heroin problematically, if you're the supplier as a doctor, that then you've got them somewhere where you can take care of them and you can direct them yeah, to treat and make services. sure they're not getting 
nasty gear and all the rest of it. Exactly. Whereas organised crime are just exploiting those people who are vulnerable. Yeah. Right? They might be people with PTSD. They but, might be people with childhood traumas. Uh, yeah. And, worse and, th- and that, they are. Worse than that, they're targeting people. They're going, right, let's give him a bag of that and then hopefully you'll get hooked on that and all that sort of stuff. It's honking. It's a honking world. Exactly. And the people who develop problems with drugs, in particular heroin, are the people who have got emotional trauma. Yeah. Whether it's whether it's former military, whether it's someone who's got was sexually abused as a kid. I've seen the kids' times. When I was in the children's times, I've seen it all over the children's times. Exactly. So we should be taking care of these people, not leaving them to the exploitation of organised crime, especially as the money that organised crime is using from that exploitation is actually corrupting the systems. It's corrupting the police. So it's a mess, right? Prohibition, drug prohibition is a mess. So my organisation campaigns to end it. We want to take legal control. Um, It should be controlled by governments, licensed retailers, doctors, not yeah. ga- not gangsters, right? So that's our main campaigning point. And I've written two books. Uh, I wrote a memoir. So if, if people want to listen to more of my stories, my memoir is called Good Cop, Bad War. And I've written a history of British drug policy called Drug Wars. But the thing I really want to talk about, plug, is in relation to mental health. Because yeah. there is a mental health crisis in policing and broad, broadly in emergency services and the military, right? Yeah. In the example of police, there's a study last year which suggests that uh, 20% of British cops have got some form of PTSD. Yeah. Half of the rest have got potential precursor behaviours like hypervigilance, which could be an indication that they're on the way to PTSD. Yeah. That is a major mental health crisis, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's in recent times, politics... You know, the. the Police have done some bad things, right? There's been some high-profile individual cops who have created a reputation that all policing is in trouble, yeah? Yeah. That's a political crisis. We argue that you can't deal with that political crisis in policing unless you deal with the mental health crisis in policing. Yeah. You need to be looking after your cops if you want your police service to improve. Yeah. I think that's logical. Yeah. The same applies for... Fire, uh, service, ambulance drivers, and military. So, one of the things that my organization does from an international advocacy point of view is we um, spend time at the United Nations in Vienna and we do side events at the Committee on Narcotic Drugs, which is so it's all of the world's nations meeting to talk about drug policy. And we do side events. Next March, we will be doing a side event where we will be demanding, and we will have a row of cops, from one, one from France, one from America, from different countries, there's a row of cops on this panel, and we will de- be demanding that the United Nation speeds up adequate therapy for police officers. And specifically what we mean by that is psychedelic therapy, because we've had 60 years of no advancement in psychiatric care no advancement in treatment of PTSD. And suddenly, in the last few years, there are these new treatments which are dramatic. I mean, the evidence for the treatment of PTSD from MDMA therapy, psilocybin therapy, uh, ayahuasca, some of the evidence is extraordinary. Yeah, It really is. To the point that the only thing that's slowing it down now is ideology. Governments who don't like the idea are finally admitting that some of these illegal drugs have actually got some medical use. Yeah. And it's preventing people need it, getting the help that they need. So we're going to demand that the United Nations speeds this up. We're talking about cops, but we will also mention the other services as well. Yeah. But we've got a row of cops saying this. We need to speed this up. We're, going to, we're doing the same speaking to the European Commission, the European Union, um, and we, we, we do the same speaking to politicians in this country. What do you think the chances are, A, of that happening, all right, of, the, of, of them speeding up? I, I'd suggest, I'd hope it would be quite quite a realistic chance. But the one that I don't think has got any chance at all, if I'm honest, is them legalising drugs across the board. I don't think they'll ever do it. I just, for some reason, it, it's, it's in me, do you know what I mean? I don't think they'll ever do that. Well, I mean... I'll take the second point first, yeah. uh, that it's happening. You, okay. We are now having legal cannabis markets. You've okay. got le- It's legal right across Canada for cannabis. Uh, 24 of the US states are now legal. It's okay. about to go legal in Germany, the biggest economy so you in think Europe. that will eventually, you know, then they'll go, right, let's bolt that one. But it's on creeping up. I mean, yeah. and, and the most important drug to make, to legally control is heroin, right? Yeah. 
Well, they do that in Switzerland and they do it in the Netherlands. If you develop a problem with heroin in Switzerland, you can get it prescribed in a clinic and you are looked after. Okay. So there's no organised crime exploiting anyone using heroin problematically in Switzerland. You know, the real, the, the real um, annoying thing about that is they started doing that in 1994. They used British evidence to do it. And, we and instead have, of we're still not doing it. Not. And instead of following that evidence ourselves, we went. We got tougher and tougher. And now we've got record drug deaths, highest drug deaths in Europe. We've got organised crime using children to deal heroin in Switzerland. There's no de children dealing it because doctors are controlling it with a prescription yeah, pad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it works. So it works. And the evidence is there, and the the difference between Switzerland and here is so dramatic. So it's happening. We are. Yeah. We've got legal heroin. We've got legal cannabis. We just need to keep. Uh, bringing in the different commodities and, and working out the models of how we're going to do it. So it will it will happen, but it's it's our job as a campaign group to speed up that happening. Okay. But in your, your first part of your question, uh, the and I think you asked this, the, the medical side of access to psychedelic therapy, well, yeah. in the United States, it's happening much quicker. Okay. And the reason for that is that in the United States, they've got a strong tradition of looking after their former military. Yeah, they a, are. A yeah, genuine yeah, struggle. Yeah, they it, do a lot better. And it them. pisses me off that we yeah. haven't got the same tradition here, to be honest, because, you know, we have homeless military. It doesn't, it doesn't want to happen there. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. And it is for the treatment of military that it's it's pushing along the debate about psychedelic therapy to the point that President Biden a year ago appointed a two-year task force to speed up how they could get this uh, this therapy to people who need it. And the reason for that is because there was such a political push right. to look after the mental health of veterans. And that's what changed the debate there. So it's coming. It's just not fast enough here. Yeah, yeah. No, it needs to be done. I mean, and you look at the, you look at some of the stats and figures surrounding, you know, not just mental health, but the, the suicide aspect of that. And I hate the S word, you know what I mean? But they're horrendous, horrendous, horrendous figures. It's They are incredible. Yeah, they. if you compare them with other um, like professions, it's astonishing. There's a friend of mine, actually, who uh, we, we speak alongside each other at events sometimes. He's called Keith Abrams, and he's former military, former parachute regiment, I think. He heads up an organisation called Heroic Hearts in the UK, and they campaign for exactly that, for the act, speed up access to psychedelic therapy for military vets. And his charity, he actually sends military vets to Peru to have ayahuasca ceremonies. Okay. A, psych a psychedelic experience. He's done it himself. He's met, he's now uh, considered because he considers himself completely well from PTSD, and many other members of his organisation have done it as well. And he's he's a fascinating geezer. You should perhaps consider yeah, him as well, a guest. Maybe, maybe try and get him on. Yeah. Listen, I'll, it's been a fascinating talking to you today. Um, I hope all this stuff that you're doing comes to fruition. You know, and if there's any way that we can support it, I'm sure we will. Do you know what I mean? So, like I say, make sure you. Put all our stuff up. We'll, we'll put all your stuff up for you. Send us all your links, all that sort of stuff. Thanks for coming on. Hopefully, you'll become a friend of our community that we've built with, within sort of like For Force Radio. And uh, we'll see you again sometime. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks, Cheers, bud. All right. Nice one.